parents, you don't have to be thinking of them. Everything you do is helping your parents. Your parents are very blessed. They have a religious child. It's an amazing, you don't understand the gift your parents have. It's like mind boggling when you think the difference for your parents that they have a religious child if they had not had a religion. It's not night and day, it's beyond day. Your parents are so helped by everything you do. Imagine every time you make a blessing, every time you say a prayer, every time you give staka, every time you light those Shabbos candles, every time you keep Shabbos, every time you kosher, every time your entire life this is helping them. Comforts, true, real, perspectives in Judaism on passing on the afterlife what the soul is going through and for them it could be very good but we're still left behind and we still could have a lot of pain which doesn't mean we deny pain but means we put it in perspective the comfort thinking about the person who passed away and knowing they're in a good place now now of course that's my assumption just like the assumption is that the person within 11 months has progressed to the supernal reward what we call Gan Eden and that's why we don't need to say Kaddish anymore. Obviously we're not perfect, but the assumption is that most people are good. So a good person is in a good place. This was a good person. He or she is in a good place. And that's a very big comfort. Some people, people that were in pain, it's not in pain now, not suffering, in a good place. Another comfort that we sometimes think, especially for someone who passed away young, but of course it would be true for anyone, we assume they fulfilled their mission. I think it's especially if you passed away young, because then of course our question is, well, why would someone pass away at such a young age, well, it must be they fulfilled their mission. They fulfilled why they're in this world. But of course, a person could pass away at any age and we can take comfort that we're here for a reason and we trust, we assume, because this was a good person, that they did their job. They did the reason their soul had to come back one more. The comfort, of course, that we discussed, the idea of sending those care packages, of sending our good deeds, our Torah study, our commandments. We said if it's our parents, it's automatic. And if it's not a parent, we consciously send it. That's a tremendous comfort because very often there's the pain is, what can I do for them now? Maybe sometimes it's like guilt, like did I do enough? And sometimes it's just pain. What can I do for them? Well, we can, you know, we can and we do. And it's very significant. It's not like I'm doing this to make myself feel better. No, it's very, very, very significant. You know, it's interesting because as I, I mentioned when we spoke about saying to Hillam, saying Psalms, and I said that life continues and I say my father's Psalm and my father-in-law's Psalm, both of whom passed away. And I, you know, just say it. But lately, I'm sure because of this class, <laughs> when I say it, I'm a little more intentful. I really am thinking like, oh, wow, I'm giving a care package. I'm really doing something very meaningful. This is really a very big elevation for their soul. They can't do this for themselves anymore, but I can. In other words, like a lot of times, if I have a lot of psalms to say and not so much time, this would be the first psalm I would skip. I mean, like, it's not like they're in pain now or, or, or need a salvation like other people on my list. But now I'm more intentful because of everything we're discussing. I'm more focused on the concept of how, no, this is so, so, so meaningful to the person who departed to that soul, it's such a huge gift I'm giving them. And it therefore it's a, it's not something I should skip either. Don't skip any of them. Shouldn't skip it either. A comfort is remembering how the person lived, remembering what they did in their life, remember what they accomplished, remembering the relationship, remembering the love, those memories we have forever. And they comfort us. Comfort is re understanding they, they, this person, this soul, this departed, is still aware of me, still loves me, still tries to help me, right? That's a traditional Jewish expression. I'm not saying it's in the religious liturgy. It's a traditional expression. After someone passes away, we give the wish they should be a gute better, which means a good advocate. That's what we say as Jews. That's how we think of it. Someone passed away, they'll be a good advocate for you. It's a comfort. We can still turn to them. As we spoke, you can go to the grave to bring invitation. Their presence is still where they live. That's why the best place to sit Shiva is in the house of the deceased because they're still connected to their home. The comfort, as we spoke of, that they will still come to our life cycle events. We said three generations come to a wedding. These, these, these are very, very, very strong comforts because they're very real. They're very true. They're still with us. They're still aware of us. They're still advocating for us. They're still loving us. You know, mother is always a mother is always a mother. 
So they're still trying to help us. They're just still trying to be there for us. That's a very, very, very big comfort. I know we're talking about weddings. I felt so strongly, most strongly by my first son's wedding. My father, I felt my grandparents, and I also felt other people. I felt other people were there. I felt a rabbi that my husband was very close to was there. I felt my aunt was very close to me and very close to the son that got married was there. I felt very strongly all of their presence by the chuppah because they really all can come. They really all are there. It's very, very, very palpable. If you're thinking, if you're focused, if you're aware, they really are coming. They really are there. And there's a comfort that we believe in the afterlife, that we know of the afterlife, that we know life continues, that we know we're in pain. We have a loss. They're fine. It's a comfort that we believe in Trias HaMesim, the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead is a process. When we have the complete revelation of Mashiach, we're already in the process of the revelation of Mashiach. When we have the complete revelation of Mashiach, all the righteous immediately have resurrection. Now, these are two different words in English. First thing, this isn't your native language, but by now it might be. They might sound the similar. They're two different words. There's reincarnation and there's resurrection. Reincarnation, as we've discussed, is when the soul comes back down one more time for all of the reasons we said why a soul will come down. To help the world, to finish their allotment of all the 613 commandments to rectify something they did wrong, to help a person that was wrong by them, or to be the person that someone else can make it up to, all the reasons. That's reincarnation. And we're all very old and have been here many times. Resurrection means when we have the complete revelation of redemption. And every single Jew who ever lived will live again. So it's not a reincarnation. This is an eternal life. Just as all of us, all the living will have eternal life, any Jew that ever passed away will have eternal life, not as souls. Like right now, they're all eternally alive. Yes, every Jew that ever lived is eternally alive because a soul is forever. No, we mean eternally alive down here in this world, souls and bodies. It's a gradual process. As I said, the very righteous immediately, instantly, have this resurrection and we're told they have it immediately because they're so righteous. Obviously they worked very hard to bring redemption. So if they work so hard to bring redemption, they shouldn't be here to, to, to celebrate it. Now, obviously the souls above, trust me, they're all celebrating, but it's different than being here. It's not like watching a video of it. It's not like watching it on your TV screen or on the movie. It's different when you're there, right? There's a reason we go to the event as instead of just watching it on the cameras. So the very righteous immediately be resurrected. And then it's a process over, over 40 years. The process will take, we're told, 40 years. And the 40 years are going to be based, meaning how long over the 40 years it takes, has really two factors. The factor of proximity to passing. How recently did this person pass away? and the factor of their personal righteousness. If a person passed away very recently, it's easier for them to be resurrected. It was like less difficult to get back into that body, so to speak. They haven't, they haven't grown out of it already so much. And the more righteous a person is, the more natural it is for them to come back. But in the end, take 40 years, but in the end, every single Jew who ever lived will come back and live forever. Every person will come back as they were when they passed away with whatever harm to their body, whatever damage, whatever illness, and then immediately will begin the process of healing. So we know this is going to happen. We know right now every soul lives on forever. We know there's the afterlife. We know there's reward. We know there's, as we call it, Gan Eden. And we know they're ultimately going to come back with the resurrection and we will be reunited with them. And this also is a very strong thing of like, it's not over. Life continues eternally and we'll be with them again. So these are different comforts that both we can think of for ourselves and also obviously we think of in terms of sharing with other people that are in pain. So from all the different things I just said, anything specifically 
touched you as something you would re want to remember for yourself or you'd want to remember to share with someone else? Was anything more meaningful to you? I have a question, Cyril. About re yes, about resurrection. Mm -hmm. How about the evil Jews, like um, the souls who had Karat? Um, are they going to be resurrected also yes. eventually? Yes, yes. We, we even believe JC will come back. We can't think of anything worse than that. And we believe that he will come back as well. Absolutely. Um, we, it's just uh, a soul is a soul is a soul. Whatever happened, whatever the person did, and obviously people that did such extreme transgressions have needed tremendous cleansing. In the end of the day, every soul is God's only child. Every such Jew is God's only child. And my assumption, now again, this is just an assumption, is any, God forbid, Jewish archvillain, you would hope there aren't really Jewish archvillains, but if there were, any such person might come back anonymously, not with his name tag, that we know who he was, that we would have any sense of like, oh my gosh, him? Shouldn't have to suffer that embarrassment, that, that shame that disgrace, but every single Jew will come back. Um, then come back, the evil will be gone because there will be no evil at that point. There's no evil in the world. You look at the, the world as it now is. Imagine if at this moment there was a complete revelation of redemption. Evil will be removed. It will also be removed from people that are evil. It will be removed. Evil will be gone. Can you explain about Karet? Like it's the soul is removed from source of life, right? Mm -hmm. Um, for sinning, like extreme sinning. So if the soul is removed from, so the soul disappears. No, no. Soul, a soul can never disappear. A soul is a piece of God. It has all those properties of God of being absolutely infinite. The soul never disappears. It means the soul isn't connected to that life energy because it doesn't deserve to be connected because of what the person did. But nowadays, we're told that people that deserve that continue to live because they're actually choosing, choosing to get life from unholy sources. So that's why people that, according to God's law, should have passed away because of their actions, continue to live because they're no longer getting life from pure godly sources. But in previous times, like in the times of the temple, when the Jews as a nation were too holy to get life from anything but pure godliness, if that source of life was cut off, the person passed away. But the passing away is part of their, what we call tikkun, part of their rectification. So it's not like, oh, this person is so bad, we're chopping him off of the Jewish people. There's no one we chop off of the Jewish people. There's no Jew that we remove from the Jewish people. We're all in this together. We're all one organism. We're all one body of Kal Yisrael, the Jewish people. So even such a Jew who deserves to pass away and does pass away, and is removed from that source of life. It's not like now a soul is over and done and will, will disappear. No, no. The soul will go through many long, hard cleansings until it too can, can be re-embraced with life. Like, remember I told this class when we we're talking about Gilgulim, when we we're talking about reincarnations, I told how this, the incident as it's recounted in the Talmud of El Azar ben Dordaya, if you remember El Azar ben Dordaya, who was this incredibly, incredibly wicked person, and at the end of his life, he did a tremendously sincere repentance, and a heavenly voice came out and said, Reb El Azar ben Dordaya, he's a Reb, he's our teacher, because he taught us the power of repentance, can now enter Gan Eden. And the question is, what do you mean enter Gan Eden? He, fine, he repented, he's not going to be cleansed and punished, but what good does he have to enter Gan Eden with? What good did he do his whole life? And it's explained, well, he was a reincarnation of Eleazar Harkonnes, Eleazar Harkonnes, who was very good for most of his life, and at the end was so, so, so evil. The last year of his life was so, so, so evil. 
So such a person, now I'm flipping the story the other way to understand my point. So another Arcanist, the end of his life, he was so evil, so evil. He's not thrown in the garbage can. So God sends him to this world for reincarnation, for another reincarnation, for cleansing, for more cleansing. In the end of the day, we're going to cleanse off all of the evil that this person accrued on his soul. We're never going to, nobody's disposable here. Nobody's garbage. Nobody's, well, we don't want someone like you in God Eden. No, we do. We just have to help you get cleansed that you can get there. But in the end of the day, Elizabeth Harkin has got into God Eden with the repentance another incarnation of his did. So that's true for every soul. No soul is vanished or dissolved or destroyed. They just need very intense cleansing. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, any other questions? So a uh, uh, person comes back at that age when they passed away? Yes, they come back at the age, they come back at the stage. If whatever happened to them, that's how they come back. If they were missing a limb, if they drowned, if they were burned, if they were very ill, whatever it is, their body is resurrected exactly like that. And then immediately there's healing because there's no illness by the redemption. So whatever are the illnesses or, you know, whatever things happen to the body, whatever a cause, the cause of death, it's all healed. And the person lives in that body. That's as we've explained before, why we have to spiritually cleanse the body because that body is the body the soul will inhabit by the resurrection. And, and if I remember correctly, you said that if the person passed away very old, then it will body become younger. Yes, the body will become younger and younger and younger until the body reaches the biological age of a 20 year old all of our bodies our bodies will also grow back okay good that's good and uh, if that moment um whatever that moment i understand it's like 40 years so but for each person it's their personal moment in that 40 years yes so that moment but that that whatever moment of mashiach someone is very sick alive what happened to that very sick person who is alive? Immediately his body will be healed. Just like everyone else who's sick at any point of illness, when Mashiach comes, all illness will be removed. So if a person who's blind will be able to see, and if a person has cancer throughout their body, it will be gone. And if a person is lame, they will be healed. Every Ill illness is, is evil. Illness we view as an evil. Death we view as an evil. It's not an evil that a person is making, you know what I'm saying? It's not an evil that a person is creating this evil. But this goes back to the first primordial sin when death came into the world, right? When three hours into the creation of man, right? When we, when we have, no, I'm sorry, it was less than three hours because they had to wait three hours. So it was less than three hours into the creation of man. And, and they sinned and then death came into the world. Death is that ultimate expression of the sin when we receive the Torah before we messed up 40 days later by the sin of the golden calf, the world changed. And one of the changes that happened was we were told we're free from death. Now, 40 days later, we lost that freedom, but we had this respite from death. Why, why from death? Isn't death natural? No, death is evil. So death is an evil and, and illness is considered an evil an evil of exile and all those evils will be removed one absolutely. more question absolutely um i think i read in um the midrash says that three refugee cities will be built when mashiach comes three additional it. ones meaning additional. We'll have yes, three additional right so why do we need the city of uh, refuge if there are not going to be any violence crime killings that's my question. Excellent question. Many, many commentators ask, just like Menucha does. What Menucha is saying is God connected Mashiach redemption to a commandment. What's the benefit of it being connected to a commandment? Because a commandment has to be fulfilled. Meaning, if Mashiach was not connected to a commandment, God promises us Mashiach, right? It's in Torah, it's in all the prophets. But all of those things maybe could manifest in a more spiritualized form, 
So we could have this spiritualized version of Mashiach, which is nice, but we want the physical reality. So to ensure that it's a physical reality, God linked it to a commandment because the only way this commandment can be fulfilled is with Mashiach. So that means Mashiach has to come because every will of God has to ultimately happen. And the only way this will of God can happen is with Mashiach. So Mashiach has to come as a physical reality. Okay, that, that makes sense. That's a, a good idea of God's to make sure it's physical. So God has 613 commandments to choose. <laughs> you know, He can link Mashiach to any commandment he wants. And he chose to link it of all commandments, what would strike us, well, obviously our brains aren't like God's, as the most bizarre thing to the commandment of a city of refuge. Why? What's a city of refuge? A city of refuge is if someone murdered, accidentally or deliberately, the relatives of the murdered party have the right to kill the murderer. They will not be harmed or hurt in any way. There'll be no punishment, not from man and not from God, if they kill the one who just murdered their relative. To protect the murderers, they run to a city of refuge. And the ways were marked and every crossroad had a clear sign so people should know where they're racing to to get to that city of refuge. When they're in the city of refuge, they cannot be harmed by the relative. If they were an accidental murderer, they stay in the city of refuge until, again, because this is all very spiritual, so it's a very spiritual concept. They stay there until the death of the high priest. The high priest passes away six months after their verdict was determined. They're out in six months. The high priest passes away 40 years after their sentence there. They're there for 40 years. They're in that city of refuge until the passing of the high priest, if they're an accidental murderer. If they were a deliberate murderer, then they would be taken out of the city of refuge to be killed if the court could actually prove they were a deliberate murderer, which is pretty hard in Jewish law. So God linked Mashiach, time of absolute peace, absolute goodness, no evil, no sin, no murder, not accidental or deliberate, to this commandment. How did he link it? Because God said that originally you're going to make six cities of refuge. And when there's the redemption, you should make three more. So by the times of the redemption, I want you to have nine cities of refuge, which means the only way we'll ever have nine cities of refuge is if we have redemption. So this means redemption has to come. Yay. But why did God put it to such a commandment that seemingly has no relationship to murder? So it's a great question. And there's many, many, many answers. A very simple answer is that the city of refuge is necessary because every single Jew who ever murdered deliberately or accidentally from when the Jews were exiled over 1900 years ago and could no longer use cities of refuge, any Jew in any incarnation that ever murdered has to go temporarily to the cities of refuge for their part of their spiritual cleansing because that's what Torah says you do if you murdered. In other words, it's not only to run away from the wannabe potential relative murderer, it's also part of your spiritual cleansing. So all the Jews that this ever happened to over 1900 years, so that's why we have nine cities of refuge. That's the most simple, logical answer. And then there's many, 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 many more. So I'm sending care packages to, um, let's say, my parents, right? And and mostly to people who live right now, right? So I'm trying to do mitzvahs and let's have people in mind. Uh, with, that, with all that, um, let's say, majority of my family uh, died in Holocaust, right? With, with their children. And so basically nobody uh, said Kaddish for them and um, nobody did any care packages for them. Is there something that I should be contemplating? Well, it depends. It You could. Remember I shared... I shared the incident that the Rebbe spoke with that man whose brother died 
right, right I shared that with in this class how his brother died like right after the Holocaust and his brother keeps coming to him in his dream like three times a week for 45 years right but right. it was so his, it, so it, that, it, the brother right. was clearly showing I need your help I need your help I right. need your help but that was the brother right I'm thinking about two three generations so you don't have to Again, for your parents, you don't have to be thinking of them. Everything you do is helping your parents. Your parents are very blessed. They have a religious child. That's an amazing... You don't understand the gift your parents have. It's like mind-boggling when you think the difference for your parents that they have a religious child if they had not had a religious It's not night and day. It's beyond day. Your parents are so helped by everything you do. Imagine every time you make a blessing, every time you say a prayer, every time you give staka, every time you light those Shabbos candles, every time you keep Shabbos, every time you kill Shabbos, every time your entire life this is helping them. So your parents are like, whoa, that's beyond. You could consciously, and some people have a sensitivity, do more or less, for people that you know or don't know of a previous life. Now, I know for myself, this is just a very personal feeling. I'm not promoting it to anyone. But when I say Yisker, once you say Yisker, you can say Yisker forever you want. So, of course, I say Yisker for my father. I say Yisker for my father's parents. And I say Yisker for my father's grandmother, who I was named after. Now, obviously, I don't know her at all. I was named after her. But I feel a connection. This is a woman whose name I carry. I don't know really anything about her. I once saw a picture of her. That's it. An aunt had a picture. I saw it. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is a woman I'm named after. But I, I don't really know anything about her. But I know about her through my father because my father was very close to her. So I have a little bit from there. I see how she influenced my father's life and his trajectory and his journey and how he actually ultimately became religious himself. I say Yisker for her and I, I have her in mind because this is, this, this is a woman whose life I continue in a certain fashion. So you could have a feeling. And if you have a feeling for all of your family members that were killed in the Holocaust with their children and therefore there was no one to continue their legacy and you want to dedicate something for them that's that's very beautiful and would only be good but in general we should understand what Chava is asking is actually a very important thing to understand if a person passes away the term in Hebrew we call it is Al Kiddush Hashem Al Kiddush Hashem means for the sanctification of God's name so Chava mentioned her relatives that were murdered in the Holocaust. Now, the world has been washed in the blood of the Jews. And we all, I am sure, we just don't know them. Go back generations, generations, generations of ancestors that, that died for God. That, what does it mean died for God? Does it mean they were the ultra-religious? Nothing to do with that. It means they died because they were a Jew. It could be a Jew who never knew he was a Jew. It could be a Jew who never practiced as a Jew. It could be a Jew who never believed in being a Jew. It doesn't make a difference. If you died because you were a Jew, you died al kiddush Hashem for the sanctification of God's name. This is also true, the Rebbe says, for any soldier who dies defending the land of Israel. Any Jewish soldier that has ever been killed in any of the battles or skirmishes or I mean, this week, Lo'olenu, three workers on a, on a bridge. They died because they were Jewish. Those three police officers in that patrol car, they died because they were Jewish. They died there defending Israel. So any person who dies because they're a Jew, who dies for being a Jew, who dies to defend Jews, who dies to defend Israel, is called al Kidush Hashem, for the sanctification of God's name. And this person, in their passing, has... A very different process than we've been discussing in two ways. Such a person is called a kadosh. A kadosh means a holy one. Well, they didn't seem very holy in their life. It doesn't make a difference. They became very holy through their death. Some people die a very obvious martyr's death with really self-sacrifice and they're doing everything they can to help others. It doesn't need any of that. They simply died because they were a Jew. They died defending the land of Israel. So how is their passing after they pass away different? One is they don't need any of the after-death cleansing we've discussed. Chibut HaKever, Kafakela, Gehenam. None of that is necessary for them. Their death cleanses them, cleanses their soul totally of 
any garbage that had been accrued in their lifetime. That's the first difference. The second difference is this act of supreme sacrifice creates the enormous reward they will enjoy in Gan Eden. These little children in the Holocaust, I mean, what? So they're not going to have any Gehenna, but how could they have Gan Eden? They, they didn't live. They, what did they do for God? They died because they were a Jew. That's what they did for God. So not only, of course, do they have no after-death purging, but they have enormous bliss, high, high-level Gan Eden for, for giving God the sacrifice of their life. So this is different than a Jew who, let's say there's a Jew who doesn't know much about Judaism and doesn't do much for God, does many transgressions, doesn't do too many commandments. Well, such a person, we say, will never be punished, will never have to go through any of the Gehenna punishments and cleansings for what they did wrong. But they don't have the merits for Gan Eden. They, they, they'll have some Gan Eden because every Jew must do something good, but not that much, do that much. But a person who died in the Holocaust or any other time before or after any, anything that happened on October 7th or since, any such person not only needs no cleansing, but that very act creates enormous, enormous merit. So every one of your relatives that passed away in the Holocaust, every one of them is in a very, 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 very good place. But as we said before, however good, good is, you could always want better. You can always have more. And therefore, it's a beautiful thing to do something for them. But you should know they're all in a very, very, very good place. And again, this applies Holocaust. It applies dying because you're a Jew. It applies for soldiers of Israel in all of those situations. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, um, a lot of my relatives, um, if, a, if a Jew was not captured during Holocaust, was not captured by Germans, but was you know, flying away from Germans, like my relatives died on the way to Asia uh, from hunger, but they were never captured by Germans. Is that something? Um, I is don't that... know. I, I hear your question. I don't know. Oh. I don't know if it would be extended as it was because of the Holocaust that they needed to be running away. And that's why it happened. Okay. But I, I, I don't know. And I don't think it's written anywhere, but the, I, I hear the question. I hear the question. You know, it's not, we don't, this is not a religion that celebrates death. We celebrate life. But we, we do understand that that type of passing away, which is so tragic and horrible, but spiritually it was, it was a very strong, strong, strong thing for God. But I don't know. It's a very strong question. I don't know the answer. Now, obviously, even like going back to what, even, even going back to what Chava said, people that, got killed in the Holocaust, it's still possible they could need reincarnation. Even though I'm saying they don't need the cleansing, and even though I'm saying they have all the reward, for whatever reason, they could also have reincarnation. They could need it, as we said, maybe because they didn't do all 613, or the world needs their energy. They need to rectify a wrong they did to a person. A person needs them to rectify a wrong they did to them. It's also possible, there's a little more of a subtle example of reincarnation that we spoke about before, that part of the soul stays above and gone Aden, and the other part has to come down back into this world. Remember, a flame, we think of that flame metaphor. The soul is like a flame that it can ignite another flame, but it's whole and the other flame is whole. So a part of the soul stays above and gone Aden, a part of the soul comes down. And of course, that, that goes back into this whole idea by re reincarnation, 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 ultimately by the resurrection of the dead, every single soul that ever lived will come back. So if this is my 10th or 20th or 30th lifetime, all those other nine or 19 or 29 people, even though they're all part of me and I'm the sum total composite of all those lifetimes, but every one of them individually lived. Every one of those souls had their own individual journey and therefore they each will have their own resurrection. So what are souls doing in Gan Eden? That's what we didn't discuss yet. One thing that a lot of souls are doing, primarily what most of the souls, if not all of the souls, are doing in Gan Eden, actually I would say all of the souls in Gan Eden, are learning Torah. Before we're born, if you remember, we discussed the soul before it comes into this world, learns the Torah like pre-teaching, because we need that pre-teaching to be able to absorb it in this world. But here, it's not pre-teaching, you already lived a life, 
but it's afterwards for a very different reason to connect to God by accessing the godliness in the Torah, not doing it for intellect, but doing it for God, which actually is true in this world as well. When we do commandments, commandments can keep us busy all day and they should keep us busy all day and they are for the world. Tyra is for us. And for us, meaning, just like the souls in Gan Eden, to connect our soul to God. Torah, therefore, is actually the only food of our soul. You can do commandments all day long and your soul is starving. Your soul is weak. Your soul is languishing from hunger because the only thing that feeds your soul is Tyra. So just like in this world, the only thing that feeds my soul is Tyra. Now, in this world, you want a strong, healthy soul? Come to class, come to many classes, study much Tyra, get other people to have strong, healthy souls and study Tyra. And the same thing continues after a person passes away. Of course, there, they can't do commandments. Mitzvahs are not possible to have a commandment. You need a physical body, which they do not have above in Gan Eden. So obviously there's no concept of being busy all day with the commandments, but they have just like we have this relationship to God through Tyra. They learn Tyra and they access God in it, which is all the soul wants. It's all my soul wants here, and it's all my soul wants after, it's all my soul wanted before. I again, now, I might think I'm learning to know what to do. I have a question, I wanna know the answer. I'm understanding more our her history and our heritage. But in the end, that's all the, the on the surface. The core real point and purpose of studying Tyra, like we are doing right now, is to connect to God in the Tyra. And this is tremendous pleasure for the soul. All the pleasures of this world wrapped up, whatever you think is a pleasure in this world, point make it one package, can't compare to the pleasure the soul in Gan Eden has of getting God in Tyra. Meaning maybe now I could learn and be bored. You could come to my class and be bored. You could open up a book and sometimes be bored. There in the afterlife, there's no, no fear of being bored. It just feels so, 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 so good. Now, obviously, that's still not the ultimate for the soul. The soul wants Mashiach. The soul wants a resurrection because the soul doesn't want to be above studying Torah and getting all that pleasure and getting all that godliness. The soul wants to be down here, soul and body, where it not only gets but it can get where it can connect to not only godliness, but literally God. But in that waiting room between this life and Mashiach, the enormous pleasure the soul has from studying Torah and connecting to the godliness in Torah, that's the, such a, a pleasure that we can't even fathom it. We, our bodies will be able to contain it now. I don't know if anyone here has a sense of Torah versus commandments, where they feel more connected to God. I know what I was just saying, the slant I was just bringing, but anyone has their own personal feelings on when they, where they feel more connected or more God-centered when they're serving and doing the commandment or when they're studying Torah? I feel more connected when I study Torah. <clears throat> I, I feel, um, I, I do, I can't say that I understand why it's sad, it's nourishment because it, um, you, it calms me down if I was said before it just gives me tranquility it gives me it's very special so, so beautiful. It's